we just keep borrowing and borrowing and spending and spending, and it will bankrupt this country if it continues. 2009, when the economy collapsed and the financial system was at risk, and what we started doing was just bailing out banks, bailing out, just shoveling out money to whoever wanted it, and that probably wasn't a very good idea. You don't take money from companies that did the right thing and give it to the companies that did the wrong thing. That's the opposite of capitalism. So we should have just suspended the income tax for a year. It would have been cheaper than all the bailouts, and that would have really inspired people to go out and work and start new businesses and recapitalize the country. Washington is just sucking power from the rest of the country. It's like we pay our tribute to Washington. They're supposed to work for us, but we're working for them now. There are many things you can lose during a recession. During the Great Recession, or indeed the Great Depression, some people lost everything. The financial loss is immediate and clear. Less obvious is the loss of economic freedom and expansion of government that often accompanies efforts to address the problem. With us today on Fresh Look America is Stephen Moore, top economic advisor during the Trump administration and the author of GovZilla, How the Relentless Growth of Government is Devouring Our Economy and Our Freedom. Stephen, what is potentially at risk if we enter a deep recession? Well, people's livelihoods are at risk, obviously, as you quite correctly said. People's homes are at risk. People's lifetime savings are at risk. People, when the stock market crashes like it did in the first half of 2022, you know, the United States uh, wealth and savings was reduced by $10 trillion. That's a one followed by 14 zeros. So an enormous reduction in people's um, lifetime savings and retirement accounts. Um, I am worried about a housing bubble bursting and people losing their homes uh, because the value of homes is going to go down. And that means the, pe the equity that people have in their homes is going to fall. And then usually if, if you have a recession, and I hope that if we have one, it's a soft recession, not a crash landing recession, you're going to have a lot of people lose their jobs as businesses contract and a lot of businesses go bankrupt. And, you know, small businessmen and women put their whole lives into building up these businesses. So it's a, it's a miserable situation when the economy starts to contract. And what's really frustrating to me is that the contraction of the economy we're seeing really is the opposite of what we should be seeing. If we had stuck with Donald Trump's policies, now I'm a little biased because I work for Donald Trump on the economy, but we would have the economy flying high right now. You know, COVID is behind us now for the most part. We've got our businesses reopened, people going back to work, uh, people spending again. So there's no reason this economy shouldn't be really strong. And it's a result of almost every decision that Joe Biden has made on the economy, and I can't think of too many exceptions, has been exactly the wrong thing to do. How do you expect the government to react to it? If we have this recession, I think we probably are in a recession already, then I hope they don't panic. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting because whenever the government panics, and politicians panic, we oftentimes get really bad policy results. So I remember back in, 19, in 2008 and 2009 when the economy collapsed uh, and the financial system was at risk. And what we started doing was just bailing out banks, bailing out, just shoveling out money to whoever wanted it. And that probably wasn't a very good idea. You don't take money from companies that did the right thing and give it to the companies that did the wrong thing. That's the opposite of capitalism. And then, of course, think of the way that we collapsed uh, and, and panicked um, after the uh, COVID crisis. There was no reason to lock down our economy for month and month and month and month and month. There was no reason. And we knew after a couple months uh, that the states could handle this without shutting down businesses and restaurants and churches and stores and schools. But we acted foolishly because people were panicked. So my first advice was, number one, don't panic. The second piece of advice, look what's worked throughout history. Uh, when I first came to town in the early 1980s, Ronald Reagan was president and we cut taxes, we reduced regulations. We didn't increase government spending, we cut government spending. So this idea that somehow government spending is a stimulus to the economy is one of the great fairy tales of all time. The government can only give you a dollar if it takes a dollar away from me. Uh, it's just redistribution game of, of taking from people who have been producing and giving it to people who aren't producing. And so uh, I do worry that especially with Joe Biden in the White House and uh, Nancy Pelosi running the House of Representatives, and then you've got, uh, of course, Chucky e. Schumer running the Senate, that those three have so many bad ideas that they keep peddling that I, I do believe that their policy responses could make it really a lot worse. During times of pro-growth policies like the Reagan years or the Trump years, like you mentioned, 
it's pretty clear that the economy grew under these policies. Why does the current administration feel so reluctant to apply them again? Because the left in America isn't about helping poor people or reducing racism or, uh, you know, uh, trying to rebuild the economy. The left is about one word, P-O-W-E-R, power. They want power. They want to tell you how to live your life. I mean, my gosh, think about this. They're, they're telling you, you know, what schools your kids can go to. They're telling you, commanding you about, you know, now they want to get rid of cigarettes. You can't smoke a cigarette. They want to tell you what, uh, what, what you set your thermostat in your house, what light bulb you use. I mean, every decision that you make now, it's almost like the politicians have to approve it. And we're just surrendering our freedoms day after day. And I try to tell the young, especially the young people who think, Big government is the solution. I say, you know, first of all, um, you know, freedom is a such a precious, precious commodity, and it's rare. Most people in the world don't have the freedom we have. The vast majority of them don't. So why would you want to give up your freedom to other people, to politicians who are going to then, you know, turn against you? And and the power that you give them, they will take, and they will um, take less power away from you to decide for yourself about how you want to live your life. How has the government expanded during the 2008 financial crisis and perhaps previous financial crises? When the 2008 crisis hit, we made a lot of mistakes and we started bailing out firms. We should have just suspended the income tax for a year. It would have been cheaper than all the bailouts and that would have really inspired people to go out and work and start new businesses and recapitalize the country. And then uh, Obama came in and he had all of these stimulus programs that were supposed to make the economy whole again. And we had the weakest recovery from a recession ever. Then Trump came in and, and the economy started to boom. Um, and yet, it's so interesting to me that the lesson that the left learned from the failure of Obama's stimulus was this laughable proposition that we didn't spend enough money. So they said, oh, we're going to spend two or three times more money. I mean, Obama only spent a trillion. We want to spend three, four, five trillion dollars. And uh, they spent the first three trillion dollars. And of course, that's what caused the massive inflation. I mean, when you just shovel money into the economy and you borrow and you print money to pay for all of that, it's as clear as the sun rising in the east and sun setting in the west that you're going to have inflation. I'm just surprised that there were economists who were surprised about that result. And so what we need to do now is actually cut government spending. We have to have dramatic cutbacks in government spending to repair the economy. In your book, you mentioned a quote, don't let a good crisis go to waste. Are you concerned that perhaps with the potential upcoming recession, we may lose more of these freedoms? Yeah. Well, that wasn't me that said, don't let a, uh, a, a good crisis go to waste. It was Rahm Emanuel, who was then the uh, chief of staff for Barack Obama. And what they meant by that is, you have a crisis, then you can come in and do whatever you want. And that's why Joe Biden was able to spend $3 trillion that we didn't need that really ruined the economy. Uh, he used the crisis as the pretext for all of the spending that they wanted to do anyways, but they used the crisis as an excuse for this. Um, and usually these uh, government spending programs, I mean, in almost all cases, they actually make the country poor. All they do is redistribute income from one person to another. They reduce incentives for people to work and invest and build businesses. And, you know, it's the, it's the free market capitalist system that is the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's not Government, government doesn't create anything except havoc and rules and regulations and bureaucrats. And so we've got to get away from this mindset that's been instilled in so many of our kids that government is, uh, you know, somehow a, uh, a benevolent force. No, I mean, it was George Washington who said that government is a fearsome master. And he was right about that. It is, government is a fearsome master. And every time you give more of your power to politicians and regulators and government, you're taking away your own freedoms to do as you wish. And this country obviously was based on the concept of people having inalienable rights to freedom.